You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Everything the White Sox touch turns to garbage. I sit around on the last show and I come up with all these stats-based, performance-based things that show you that the rotation is coming together, the pitching staff is looking good, these young arms are going somewhere, and there's at least one positive thing about the team. And then Garrett Crochet, before the episode is even published, has his worst start of the year. Nick Nestrini's back in the minors, and Jonathan Cannon is probably headed there soon as well, if he isn't there by the time you listen to this, after Nestrini and Cannon's second starts were just garbage. Everything they try to do is a disaster in the end. I don't know what else to do. I I can't find a positive on the team anymore. I give up. No, it's it's really, it's it's just... It's just hard to watch. I mean, it's not even like a fun train wreck, right? No, they're not fun. Pedro got thrown out of a game, and it was the worst ejection I ever saw. It was a boring ejection. It was a, it was a very Robin Ventura ejection, wasn't it? Just very calm. He's barely arguing. He's thrown from the game. Get your money's worth. You're not going to be a manager for long. Do something crazy. Get Fire nuts the out there. What yeah. are you doing? I mean, you're you're even you're even mediocre when you argue with umpires. You're the most mediocre manager I've ever watched manage the White Sox. Even Boom Boom Bevington, who was a moron, he had good ejections. He every oh, yeah. once in a while had his team get into a beanball war. <laughs> every once in a while there was something entertaining about him. There is nothing, nothing entertaining about watching Pedro manage a team. He is bad at it in every single way. I am convinced that a team right now who is off to the worst start in franchise history has been shut out more than one-third of the games that it has played to date. I'm convinced that team, while not at 500, while not a winning record, would be much better, would at least just be a poor baseball team playing a little under 500 if you put any other manager in there. You put Ozzie Guillen in there and he's running and bunting and having guys try to create runs and not sitting on his hands. And he's, he, I guarantee he would pinch hit for Maldonado all the time. Mar- Maldonado would never see past the seventh inning on an Ozzie Guillen managed team and never get in a bat past the seventh inning in any game that wasn't five runs in either direction in terms of the deficit or the lead. He would never, ever see the later innings with an Ozzie Guillen team. And I pick Ozzie because he's near the team. He won a World Series. He got kind of screwed over in his interview process before they gave the job to Pedro. You know he just wants to continue to light this guy up, and I hope he does. He should be lighting him up on a nightly basis. Even if they threaten to fire him, Ozzie Guillen should be lighting up Pedro constantly because guess what, Oz? They should have hired you. They could have hired a lot of other people, too. I'm not saying you were the best candidate, but they definitely should have hired you over this mope. He doesn't do anything. He contributes nothing, and he's a detriment. I believe he is the worst manager I have ever watched don a White Sox uniform. He is not the reason why they are under 500, but he is the reason they have three wins. Oh, absolutely. I, You know, this whole thing where it's like, okay, a manager can't make the players play and all these guys aren't hitting and they're not performing and they're not getting their pitches. I'm sorry. Again, one, a manager's job is to make sure that these guys are ready to play, are prepared, have good scouting reports, have half an idea of what they're going to do out there Two, be motivated to play, be ready to go in terms of their, their mental preparation to go out and play a baseball game and try hard and hustle and all the things that he's preached that we haven't seen, but he's preached to the media, at least you wonder what he's saying behind closed doors to the team. And then three, put guys in a position to, succeed. Martin Maldonado has a very lengthy major league career that shows, proves beyond a shadow of a doubt the man cannot hit a baseball worth his life. He was at one point the premier defensive catcher in the majors. There's still glimpses of that with him. He can still call a hell of a game, I'm sure. However, he's hitting 053, 053. That's not a batting average. And he's not helping. He's not helping. Like Pedro's acting like he needs him back there to put the fingers down and call the right pitch. But he had them throw a fastball 
to Sal Perez the other day where they end up losing the game. So is he really that right. great behind the plate? I, I don't remember if he's the guy behind the plate during the the uh, the Soroka game. With uh, it, where it Marsh, almost doesn't matter where Marsh hits pitchers. the home run. But here's the thing. I think Brandon Marsh hits the home run early on in that game, and I saw a grid that shows that he hits the most home runs, has the highest OPS, has the highest average when you throw him something low and inside. And in the middle of that count, that's his they threw only a, hot zone. That's his that yeah exactly. It is his hottest zone, and they threw it right into the center of it, and it was a change up. I mean, who's running this team? I mean, that's the problem. People sit there and say, oh, they'd be bad no matter what. Sure, they'd be bad. I get it. You have Paul DeYoung as your shortstop and Nicky Lopez at second base. You don't have any stars that can stay healthy. You barely have any stars to begin with. You've got nothing really in your rotation. You're put together so poorly. You have an $80 million payroll in the third largest media market in the country. Your owner's a miser. There's a million things going against you, but... The guy making the decisions game in, the guy making the lineups, the guys make the guy who's responsible for making the calls is terrible at his job. He's just god awful. He's comedic. You know what he reminds me of? I actually start whistling the song Springtime for Hitler in Germany. Have you ever seen the producers oh, where they try I to have. put on the worst play ever? They try to put on the worst play ever. And that's the name of the play in the in the in in the producers. And they're like, we'll make a bomb and it will be terrible. And it's a comedy, of course. And they get this terrible actor and everything like that. That's what Pedro is. Pedro is the worst thing you could put out there. He's comedic how bad he is. His quotes are awful. Could you imagine covering this team, Ed? You worked in the media for a little while. Could you imagine? I did. I did. Yeah, can you imagine going in to pay to, to see Pedro after a game or before a game? And he gives you the quotes that he gives uh, to, to some of these guys. Like, where's the one that he gave He gave yesterday? It was a very long one. I'll just take a poor, uh, Here it is. Grafol, this is Scott Merkin put this out. Grafol on staying positive at 3-19. and 19, Quote, today we got our ass kicked. You go home and you reflect and tomorrow's a new day. You can only learn from today and then tomorrow you start the day and that's it. The day is over. Shut up. Just, just, right. just, just stop shut talking. up. Stop reading the motivational posters over Merkin's head. Scott Merkin is dumber. Today, for having to listen to and write down that quote. The the difference between this and the producers, okay, is, is that you can have a fun, bad team. If this team was a team of guys that were try-hard guys, if they were all Danny Mendix, okay, if they were all these try-hard guys that were out there busting it, okay, and trying to do their best, and they were underdogs, and they were they they were guys that you could root for. It's great, but they are listless and lifeless, and they are veterans who were cast offs of other teams because they weren't good, and or they were injured. In the case of Mike Soroka, where it's a, a, a reclamation project, I mean, you can kind of get behind the guy, but only for so long. Or they get really excited when something goes wrong in a fantasy football league and they punch somebody. Isn't that what Tommy Pham did? Yes. I would love it if Pedro does something that annoys him. I hope that Pedro's a big fantasy sports guy. Tommy Pham coming up to this roster and punching anybody would be a welcome change. Would be amazing. But, he, but you can have good, bad teams. Look, I, I, I've i said this before, and I will keep pounding this until Jerry Reinsdorf just opens his damn mouth and admits that this is what he wants to do. But the Cubs in the 80s, when they were when they were branded as the lovable losers, when, when Wrigley Field was hopping, okay, and the Tribune company was making money hand over fist because... Everybody went out to the ballpark to watch these subpar awful teams. Okay, what the Cubs did was they had a couple guys that you really loved, guys like Andre Dawson, Ryan Sandberg, okay? They marketed the hell out of their team in terms of like these guys are fun guys, they're yeah, fun that to watch. Stupid song, go the, Cubs go. I, I, right? But you know what? It from an owner standpoint, go Cubs. That stupid ass song sells tickets. Right, and it Harry's makes out there. Money. Harry Harry's Harry's out, there. out there. Didn't didn't Reinsdorf get rid of him? Oh, is that yeah. how that worked? Yeah. yeah you know, Reinsdorf cuts off all personality from the right. team, and then guess what the Cubs do? They grab the personality, and now Harry's out there showing his, hoping that some ladies will show him hers. You know, so <laughs> it, it, it's... It, 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 tell me I'm wrong. Tell me no, I'm wrong. No, it's true. That's the thing. Like, you're right. He he took all the fun out of the team because he doesn't like criticism. He 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 made a, a mini mall. He got rid of the baseball palace of the world, and he made a mini mall. And right next to it instead. And he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't build up the area around the ballpark because he wanted you to come inside and eat his food. 
All right. I mean, like he he's made such poor decisions throughout and he shaped this team 100 percent. And he's got this mope. I mean, look at this quote from Griffo. Here's another one. And Merkin put this in. Poor Scott Merkin and all the guys. Careful, careful Scow, as you're James re- Chris, Chris careful, careful as you're reading these quotes, though. Yeah. OK, because I don't want you to suck so much oxygen out of the room that you and I pass out. I can tell you this. This is Griffo. Rest assured that everything that happens in this ball club on the field, off the field, that affects us being able to win a baseball game or affects the integrity and character of this organization is being addressed. End quote. Pedro, if it were being addressed, you wouldn't be the manager anymore. Socks in the Basement listeners switch to a new age of life for mom and dad, grandma and grandpa. Keep them out of assisted living. Make it so they can get around on their own, live independently in their own home. With stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, lift chairs, and even bathroom remodeling from Hyatt Home Medical Equipment. They work with your insurance. They have 0% financing for qualified individuals, and they have the latest and greatest in CPAP machines. Unhappy with your vendor? Hyatt is going to help you out. Switch, get your supplies directly mailed to you. Plus, you can test out the new equipment at their showroom here on the south side. And if you're looking for continuous glucose monitors, the most up-to-date equipment is at Hyatt Home Medical Equipment. Learn all about them at hhme.com. He reminds me of Han when Han would say stuff last year and Kenny when would he was, say when stuff he was last dead year. dead Rick walking. Right, yeah, and you'd be like, "That's that applies to you. You're not going to have a job soon. And I would say it over and over again. There were people who were like, oh, no, I don't know. They're going to have a job for life. I'm like, uh. I mean, like they're 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 describing themselves. This guy's describing himself. There's no way he makes it through the year. Right. At this point, they're just keeping him because they don't want us to be right. They don't want the fans to be like, yeah, we wanted to get rid of this guy and they did what we wanted. They don't want to ever do anything we want. They just want us to drink campfire milkshakes and remember it's better at the ballpark. Even there, again. You have to have fun at the ballpark to do that. And and one of the one of my biggest criticisms really of this team is these guys are just names, right? Like I understand I look, I Luis Robert Jr., when he is healthy and playing, he's an exciting guy to watch. I'm pulling for Danny Mendick, but only because, you know, a couple of years ago we kind of got a, a glimpse of of how much fun Danny Mendick could be to watch play, and then he got screwed by the team, and now he's back for a he redemption did. run. I, I, I'm, he's one of the few people I'm excited. I, I hope it works out for him. Now, again, he's on the White Sox. Remember, I started this this show off saying everything they touch. Right. Okay, I, so I'm, I, I'm hoping, I expect him to hit 120 and be down in the minors in a week. I'm hoping Danny Mendick gets to take Gavin Lux's place on the Dodgers because that would be better for him, okay? But I don't really, I really have nothing invested anymore in Andrew Vaughn or Nikki Lopez or Paul DeYoung or Andrew Benintendi or Dominic Fletcher or Robbie Gross. I didn't care about Robbie Grossman before he was on the team. I don't care about him now. And that's no slight to Robbie Grossman. He's probably a hell of a guy, but he's a journeyman outfielder. I'm rooting for Corey Lee to get more at bats. Okay. I, and, and as young guys come up, you can kind of do that, but I don't know anything about Corey Lee. Why isn't, why aren't you building up? some interest in these guys because all we get, you know, if Aloy Jimenez didn't wave to the camera and say, hi, mom, after a home run, would you have any idea that Aloy Jimenez has any kind of a personality? If he didn't do that protest thing in left field when he was playing left field and sat there and crossed his arms and gave that that really look to, to Luis Robert Jr. when he was catching everything in sight, would you have any idea that Aloy Jimenez has any personality? No, because you know what the, the Sox don't do? They don't let us get to know any of their players. They say that these are core players, but I know nothing about these guys. Okay. I have uh, Andrew Vaughn, supposedly a great guy, great leader. I've never heard the man speak as far as I can tell, at least not enough, uh, not enough for me to get invested in him. Why aren't they ever made available to talk to anybody other than Chuck? Like why, why, are you, why do you hide right. your players so much? Why is it? And, 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 you know, trust me, I think if you're paying any kind of attention, not only after they talk to Chuck, if they go on like a radio station, forget the podcast, they go on a radio station. We've heard many times before you heard Jerry Reinsdorf one time get angry on the air and say he was never coming back on a show again because they asked right. him a legitimate question. I mean, if you if you ask them anything, if you go over the line just a little bit, if you really try to find something out about the team or say anything that they don't like, you'll never get them again. So they guard them so much. So you're right. Not only do they have a bad team, but they don't make the bad team interesting in any way. No, I I, I know nothing about these players as people. I You know, I haven't seen, look, I haven't seen any of their stars or their potential stars even do like, you know, lousy commercials for local businesses. Like that's, that's a thing, right? 
you know, it, Scottie Pippen was not always the most vocal guy, but we kind of had a feel for him because he did that ridiculous Mr. Beef commercial. <laughs> you know, what, here's the thing. I keep going back to it. Uh, I'll go back to it one more time. Jake Berger and remember his wife, Ashlyn, she said it on the show and they are they were going to be make their lives public. They were going to talk with all the podcasters. They were going to hang out with the blogs. They were going to be vocal on social media. They were going to show their personality. Right. And what do the White Sox do? They dealt him away. They dealt him away in a trade that made no sense, except for if you put it in the prism of he stepped outside of the box. Right. Because the guy they traded him for is is not even, you know, at the time it was spun like this is a high end prospect from the Marlins, but this is a damaged piece of goods that they got back. This is trading Jake Berger and getting Mike Soroka, not not Mike Soroka, uh, uh, Sorotka back. You know, getting getting the guy with the bad shoulder that that everybody knows can't pitch anymore. I mean, that, that's that's what Jake Eater kind of is, and he hasn't shown anything in the minors that tells you otherwise. So, yeah, he's he's dealt away because he's not towing the company line, which the company line is wear black and white. Which, by the way, the two most boring colors you can put together. I know they look great together, but still, and don't talk. Right. Just be seen and not heard. Well, guess what, Jerry? That makes for a very uninteresting team. OK, either they have to be really awesome on the field and fun to watch where they are stealing bases if they can't hit home runs or they're hitting a ton of home runs if they can't hit singles. That's fine. I mean, if you gave me nine Kyle Schwarbers, OK, and this is guys up there just ripping it, you know, as far as they can in the outfield and it's home run derby one through nine. At least that's interesting because with every fly ball, we can all sit there and go, ah. Uh-huh. But I'm sorry, when, you know, Robbie Grossman hits a fly ball to the outfield, I know it's going to be caught somewhere in the middle of the grass. It's not that interesting to watch. It's almost like this summer, fans have to come up with a way to create their own experience because once you get over the stupid milkshake, it really isn't better at the ballpark. Like when I go this summer, I'm going to plan to do things outside of the ballpark first. Like, I'm going to eat at Cork and Carry at the park. Why would I give money to Jerry Reinsdorf any more than I'm giving him to walk in the door? Like, I want to see a baseball game, so fine. But the food selection over at the Cork is spectacular. The price is right. I can bring the whole family in there. Everybody's friendly. They got all the beers I want. They got all the wine, all the spirits. It's part of my game day experience. And of course, see more at CorkandCarry.com. And we'll see you out there this summer because I'm going to go. And I'm going to spend time just hanging out with fans. I may walk into the game in the third inning. What am I going to miss? And honestly, the new food items that generally have a hard time finding in the ballpark and the overpriced beer, I'm not in a rush to get in there and I'm not in a rush to buy it. So it goes to the miser owner because here's the thing. It all starts and stops with Jerry Reinsdorf. And very much so. And, and you know, I he's been on my mind the last couple of days. That old miser. I'm very, very sorry. Yeah, I know that, been old, on your that, mind. that I, old miser's been on my mind for the last couple of days. A guy who took over a team here, 40 years ago because his buddy Bud Selig and some other owners felt like he was good for ownership. He was not going to spend a lot of money. He was gonna. He was going to be right in the middle of all the labor disputes. He was. He. He's. They knew what he was. They knew he was the kind of guy, very much like Charles Comiskey. Like we always talk about Comiskey Park. Oh yeah, Charles A. Comiskey was a was a miser. He treated the public like they were just peons. He treated his ball players like they were cattle. He never really wanted to pay anybody, and that's why his team got angry and threw the nineteen nineteen World Series. And and it's fitting that we ended up with somebody very similar to that in Jerry Reinsdorf. Reinsdorf's a little different. Uh, all the things about Comiskey is Reinsdorf, but then Reinsdorf also has told David Sampson reportedly that it's better to come in second place. And, and let's be honest, in 2005, that team was built to be a second or third place team. Willie Harris is basically Nicky Lopez. You know, Joe Creedy had never become Joe Creedy up until that point. There are all kinds of pitchers there that were just, you know, shots in the dark. A.J. Pruszynski was on that team because he punched somebody in the nuts when they asked him if he was okay after he took a ball off the groin. That's the story in San Francisco. Like, he was somebody they wanted to get rid of. Jermaine Dye was down. That's why he was available to get. All these guys were brought in. They didn't spend a ton of money. They just they just caught lightning in a bottle and we got to enjoy it. Paul Canerco became Paul Canerco that year. There were so many things that worked out well for you. And then what did Jerry do? He got excited. There was a parade. People loved him. And he was like, you know what? Let's try to win. But the problem is he had surrounded himself with mediocre people from Kenny Williams on down. And now they had to replicate it by putting money into it and they could never do it. 
because they weren't skilled enough to do it. He had always surrounded himself with bad people because he never really cared about winning. And now fast forward to now, he's 88 years old, this old miser. And he's a billionaire who doesn't really understand what it's like in life for me or you or anybody else. He he thinks he's the smartest guy in the room because he's had some success. The, the gambit he pulled in the 80s to get his stadium and his sweetheart lease and fooled the, uh, the city of Tampa Bay and, and tricked a governor who didn't want to be known as the guy who lost the White Sox and got his sweetheart deal. And now at 88 years old, he thinks he can do it again. And he, he can't do it again because the world is different now, Ed. So now what he does, he goes down to Springfield, he totters down there and he tries to tell them all, you know, I'm going to move the team to Nashville. And they, and they laugh at him. And now you see this thing, the Bears are getting their new stadium. And Cranes, this, this is an article, there's a little snippet for, uh, in, the, in the Bears article that refers to Reinsdorf, and this is interesting. Reinsdorf told Cranes that the team's current home at Guaranteed Rate Field in Bridgeport has not worked out and needs to move to be successful. Reinsdorf, 88, said he has no plans to sell the team, but indicated that his son might well do so after he dies, unless the team has a long-term lease that would keep it in Chicago. So the threat now that the old tottering billionaire who thinks nothing of any of you, or his players, or of winning, who really doesn't care, maybe a nice guy in the hallway, that's about all I've really heard about him from people that work there, that's about it. That guy, his threat is, I'm too old to sell the team, I'm not gonna sell the team, but if I don't get a sweetheart lease, or you don't build me a monument to myself before I die, or at least I know as I pass on to the great beyond, it's going to be built with a brand new stadium. My son is going to sell the team, and those people who buy it may move the team out of the third largest media market in the country. It is the most absurd thing I've ever heard. It is the stupidest threat that I've ever heard. Because guess what, Ed? In the end, I would rather roll the dice any time, a hundred out of a hundred times, that whoever the younger Reinsdorf sells to, I would roll the dice and say, and rather have a new owner and see whether or not they keep them in the third largest market in Chicago than have a Reinsdorf own the team for another couple generations. I, I would rather have that. Let's find out right now. Get the team out of the Reinsdorf family, sell away, and I'll take my chances as to whether or not somebody would be stupid enough to move them out of the third largest market in the country. I'll take that chance. Look, here, here's there's there, the Bears thing is fascinating for, from a White Sox perspective because Virginia McCaskey is not a business person per se, okay? And, and you know, the things that you can say – about Jerry are different than what you can say about Virginia McCaskey, but she's at least had the, the, the forethought, all right, and George McCaskey had the forethought to go out and hire Kevin Warren, a business person. He was from the Big Ten, and he was he was business-oriented back then, and he's business-oriented right now for the Bears. And what Kevin Warren did was he went out and he said, I'm going to spend money on real estate that's going to retain value, by the way, okay, because Arlington Park... The former race course, it was standing abandoned. Churchill Downs had said there's no more races there, and it's just it was nothing. All right, and I and, and I know that area pretty well. And there, were, you know, Arlington Heights would sit there and go build more condos, but it's not like overpriced housing is in short supply in the northwest suburbs. So that's you know, there's not a whole lot you can do with it. Realistically, that's going to make a lot of money. So selling it to the Bears made sense. I don't think the Bears were really, really intending to go out to Arlington Heights, but Kevin Warren now had leverage against the mayor of the city of Chicago. And potentially the governor, but really against the city of Chicago to sit there and say, do something for me or we're going to Arlington Heights because I have the land. I've bulldozed the grandstand. I have bulldozed everything off of there. It is a vacant lot now waiting for us to put our fingerprint on it. And what Jerry did was he went and had lunch with the mayor of Nashville, who did not pledge billions of dollars. Neither did the governor of Tennessee pledge billions of dollars. He didn't go meet with the owner of the Tennessee Titans to sit there and say, we're going to get into a joint venture where we're going to create this super stadium that the Titans are going to play in and the White Sox are going to play in. And we're going to have Super Bowls and Final Fours and Nashville is going to be huge, right? No, 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 no. He just had lunch with the guy just to give the hint that, oh, I'm talking to guys in this, this market, this emerging market, just like I did in Tampa in the late 80s. Kevin Warren takes his leverage, his Arlington Heights leverage, goes to the city of Chicago and says, look, on the whole, we'd rather be here, but you guys got to help us out. We can't do this without you. We can't do this without help from the city. We cannot do this without some sort of help. We can do it in Arlington Heights on our own. We can't do it in the city of Chicago. Tomorrow, as you and I are sitting here, it's you know the day that this show comes out, 
They are going to announce a new lakefront stadium. The Bears are going to get what they wanted out of it because Kevin Warren put skin in the game. He bought real estate, which the McCaskies are still going to be able to turn a profit on regardless of what they do. He is going to use that leverage to get the Bears Monument Stadium, the the, the Hallis McCaskey Stadium that that you know that the the family pretty pretty much wants, so that they can go and sell because Lord knows Virginia is not long for this world. Not anything against her, but she is a very very old woman, and the McCaskies in all likelihood are going to sell when she passes. That was kind of always, that's been the plan for years for them. Yeah, but she's never passing. <laughs> I, I know she might, she might not. She's going to outlive Jerry, I think, but, oh. but here's the thing. But Ryan Storff has never given himself anybody who was a legitimate business person who had their, their finger on the pulse of what's going on now. He's always had to make the decisions on his own, which is why his media empire has never taken off because it's been a mess from the get-go because that was Eddie Einhorn's gig. But when Eddie Einhorn left and, and, and was no longer part of the team and when he passed, there was nobody for Jerry to turn to and do this. He's trying to do it on his own, which is why the marquee network happens. But Jerry's still floundering around with, with Comcast slash NBC Sports. Okay, and now now he's trying to finally get that that piece of it done, something he could have done decades ago but didn't, right? And and he built this stadium, right? He signed off on on staying and you know staying where they are. Okay, he had opportunities to do this over the past forty years, but he never had the business savvy to figure out how to make it work for himself or to understand what it was. And he never surrounded himself with anybody because you, you you hit it on the head earlier. He thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. What you have now is you have a petulant billionaire who, instead of going out and creating leverage, went out had lunch with a guy turned around and said, give me billions of dollars. You know what the Bears also didn't do? You know what I never really heard Kevin Warren say out loud, but I'm sure it's been spoken, but he's never said it out loud, was the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois need to pay the Bears billions of dollars for us to stay here. No, he never did that. He he, no, he he never did. He made he made a savvy real estate business decision on behalf of the McCaskey family, use that as leverage to now I'm sure we're going to be paying a lot of money as taxpayers for the Bears to have this lakefront stadium, by the way. I don't think this is coming for free, but he did it the right way. Jerry did it because Jerry just thought, I'm a billionaire. I'm important. I can go strong arm J.B. Pritzker because I don't like the guy, so I think he's an idiot. I can go and I can strong arm the mayor of the city of Chicago because I he's he's flailing away as the mayor and I can strong arm him because I'm Jerry damn Reinsdorf and I had the bulls in the 90s. Which, of course, Jerry, you messed that up as well, but we can go into that on a Bulls right, podcast. Right, but, but that's really the thing. One. That's the thing. He thinks that he's the powerful guy in the equation, and he's no longer powerful. Crane's just put out something today. As you're talking, I just found it. So you, I know you haven't read this yet, so I'm, I'm going to give it to you. Jerry's now acting like he would open up his wallet if the White Sox got a stadium. Like, he's going to contribute a little bit, right? What did the Bears say they were going to do? They are going to throw in $2 billion? Wasn't that what they said they were going to do? Jerry, supposedly, according to this article in Cranes, uh, maybe at around two hundred million, he would he would contribute. He wants billions of dollars from you, but he'll give you that. Think about that: two hundred million ain't that much to a guy that's worth over four billion dollars. It ain't that no, much. It's, really not. it's not really an investment. And he's like, well, you know, if everything works out, you give me everything I want, I might chip in just a little bit. He's lost. He doesn't know what to do at this point. Nobody's taking him seriously. And you know what he has? not going for him that the Bears have going for them, the Bears have hope. You actually think the Bears are going to be competitive over the next couple of years. There's a, there's people going to the stadium. There isn't a tumbleweed running through the stadium like there is at 35th and Shields. Nobody's at the games. He, he is in such a poor position right now to ask for anything and his offers to the to the politicians to the to these government agencies his his request his his the things he's pushing for they're so mid they're so they're so poor compared to what the bears are doing like what the bears are doing whether it, it doesn't matter if you agree with what the bears are doing and you wish they would have gone to Arlington Heights so they would have owned the stadium there's a million things you could get into but what the bears are doing they're outshining Jerry Reinstorf in negotiations there, there's another pro sports organization doing it better than Jerry. He looks like a court jester right now when he goes in and asks these people for money. And again, his threat is, if I die, which I, we're, guess what, Jerry? We're all waiting for it. We're, we're, anytime now. You feel no free. 
Okay. No offense. And, like, but I, either people either step die down or die. Right. Listen, know? people sadly die every day. One day I will as well. Okay. I'll be honest with you, Jerry. I would be happy if you moved to the front of the line because you have made me miserable as a baseball fan for decades. After you die, first off, none of it matters what happens afterwards, big guy. You're gone. Your billions are gone as well. And your son's going to do whatever he really wants to do. You may give him all the advice in the world. He could put you in the casket and change his mind completely. You're not in control anymore. You're dead. <laughs> I mean, think of the, Think about Pappas, this old billionaire is. He thinks he's already making decisions that will happen after he dies. Nobody needs to listen to you after you're dead. You're gone. Anybody you've made a promise to that has a job for life, the promise is gone. Everything changes once you hit the ground, big guy. And if his son sells the team, that's a good thing. And if somebody takes it out of the third largest market, they're an idiot. The best offer is going to be for somebody who wants to keep him in Chicago. These are the most empty threats, Ed. Well, all he has to do is just ask Bill Wirtz. You know, he might need to pull out a Ouija board for it, but ask ask old Dollar Bill, Jerry, how that worked out with uh, his best laid plans after he died. And yeah, because Black Rocky Hawks wasn't did. supposed to get the team. Right. It wasn't supposed to be Rocky. And guess what? No. He died. And, and guess who took over? Rocky. Rocky took yeah. over. And, Rocky you know, took over yeah. and Rocky invested in the team and Rocky started marketing his players and Rocky started making it. So, we, you know, United Center was going to be the new madhouse on Madison. Rocky turned the Blackhawks into must see TV. Right. He turned it into this is appointment viewing. This is this is important. This is important if you're a, a Chicago sports fan, let alone a hockey fan. Right. Reinstorf's family may do the exact same thing, you know, and, and that's I mean, you know, as we're sitting here saying, you know, that, that you know, I, I don't wish anything ill on, on, on Jerry Reinsdorf personally. I do. But, well, okay. Well, that's okay. I do. I'm sorry. I, I You know, I know that everybody's like, oh, it's wrong to wish for somebody to die. No, but, but if he's if he's not going to if he's not going to run the franchise the right way in 2024, I don't give a crap about how you ran it in 1989, okay? If you're not going to do it the right way in 2024, by the way, 1989, you were terrible as well, just pointing that out. But if you're not going to run it the right right way in, in, in 2024, then you step back and you let the kids take over the way Virginia has let her kids take over for years, by the way. Okay. And like you said, the Bears have hope. They have a stadium that fills out for all of their home games. They're, you know, they got the number one pick in the draft and, and Kevin Warren, again, he can sit there and, and just say, well... Do you want to watch Caleb Williams throw the ball 70 yards in the air in Arlington Heights? Or do you want to watch him throw 70 yards in the air on the lakefront? You know, it, what's Jerry going to do with that? You know, sit there and say, do you want to watch Luis Robert Jr. on the IL in Bridgeport? <laughs> or in Nashville? Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.